to Raw. I'm Alex. And I'm Matt. And we're here at the Howlets and Portland Wild Animal Parks in Kent. And today, we're going to be seeing just a few of the over 100 species that live here at the parks. Yes, some of them are approachable and friendly, some of them not so, like this emperor scorpion. Believe it or not, a scorpion can have up to six sets of eyes. And it doesn't have ears, but it can listen by picking up vibrations on tiny hairs on its claws. As well as those amazing senses, these scorpions have been known to survive the radiation from nuclear explosions. We will, of course, be bringing you lots more fascinating facts and stories about the animals that live here, including... I find out how the park's prickly porcupines are settling into their new home. It must be really hard for them to get comfy. I feed a monkey that can stuff handfuls of food in its cheeks. And we meet the park's youngest rhino, who has only just got his horn. There are 900 animals at the park and new arrivals are coming all the time. But who is responsible for whom? Well, the mothers look after the babies, that's obvious. Then a team of over 50 keepers look after the animals. But who is responsible for the keepers? Well, that would be this man. Meet Charlie Roma. He is the animal manager and is one of the big bosses. His office is the nerve centre of the park and it's from behind this desk that he coordinates everything. But today, Charlie is leaving his paperwork behind as we have challenged him to get his hands dirty and be a keeper for the day. His mission is to spend a day helping out the toughest keepers on the park, the Big Cat Squad. Meet Adrian Harland, Pete Thompson and Chris Hales. Between them, they look after the most ferocious animals in the park, including three packs of hunting dogs, five tigers and 11 lions. Charlie can't wait. It's a bit of a privilege to go back and work on the ground with the guys who really love these animals, and you won't get a more passionate bunch of guys on that section. <laughs> but the catch is that the keepers get to plan Charlie's day, and he's unaware of just how mischievous they can be. Well, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, there's got to be some uh, horrible jobs that you can get into well, there. What do you fancy, then? Harry Shed. Harry the Indian Tiger is over two metres long and nearly twice the weight of Charlie. He's enormous, but keepers keep their distance for quite another reason. Harry is an old boy and tends to wee in his sleeping quarters. He will absolutely soak the sheds. You'll, we'll clear them out a couple of days before and he'll just go straight in there and spray everywhere. Um, so they're going to be pretty smelly by the time Charlie gets around to... Uh, Going in there. His eyes are going to be streaming, dude. He's going to be crying. <laughs> it's going to be great. Before he goes <laughs> in with the tiger. <laughs> but is the smell bad enough to make his eyes water? Charlie might be office bound now, but he was once an animal keeper himself, but looked after quite a different type of creature. My, my main interest was birds, and I was head of section of birds at Melbourne Zoo. <laughs> Hang on, don't cats eat birds? Charlie doesn't stand a chance. But wait, there's more. What about the dogs, then? They're hungry. Someone taking them in there to collect bones. Yeah, absolutely, that'd be interesting, cos uh, they'll all be running around all over the place. That might uh, scare, they, scare them a little bit. They like to hang on to their collection, <laughs> don't they? Absolutely. <laughs> and fight you for it. These are not pet poodles. They're Africa's most ferocious killers and can disembowel their prey in seconds. The dogs don't like to lose their bones. They make a collection and they like to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we'll make sure he's safe. <clears throat> we won't let him know that, but we'll make sure he's safe. And uh, if it starts looking like it's um, not going to go too well, we'll escort him out. But even that's not enough for these guys. They also want to get him absolutely filthy. You think he should pick some poo up as well at yes. some point? Probably in the lions here, that'd be nice and smelly. Mm. It usually is. Hopefully there'll be quite a bit of poo out here as well for him to pick up, so he'll be in there with a rake, you know, trying to put it in the bin and things. It'll be nice and smelly for him. It'll be lovely. Maybe another thing we, you could get him to do is um, clean out this pond, you know, because um, the lions will be, what, maybe a foot away from him? <laughs> and a uh, newcomer, well, you know what they're like, the newcomers. So, um, It's yeah. going to scare the life out of him. OK, that should be enough to keep him happy for a day, I think. 
this list, Pete, because I'm not going to be here. So um, thank you very if much. You can get him to work through all of that I'm and sure add anything will. you like on the end of it. And good luck. Have a nice day. Thank, thank you very much. much. Charlie suspects there'll be some dirty play involved, but reckons he's up for the challenge. Uh, keeper's job is a dirty job, you know, and I'll be doing it, and they'll be they'll enjoy seeing me doing it. I'm sure. No, I think it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. I'm looking forward to it. Are these going to be his famous last words? <laughs> Join us later to see how Charlie gets on when he goes back to the floor and reality bites. The sooner we can get done here, the better. I feel a lot better when we get out. These aren't mutant guinea pigs from some distant planet. These are porcupines and they recently moved into a brand spanking new enclosure. I'm on my way to see how they're settling into their new pad and to help keep a Simon Jeffrey with their lunchtime feed. Wow, they are amazing. Look at all the spikes that are coming out of their backs. Oh, <laughs> what was that noise for? That's all right, that's a warning noise. Obviously, they're not quite sure about us all coming in here, and that's just kind of a thing that they're doing. So it's a sort of defensive... Yeah, and then mm. if they do want to sort of get rid of somebody coming near them, they would run backwards into you. Wow, so that's got to hurt, cos uh, they look quite do, yeah. sharp, those... What, what exactly are they? Did you say they're quills? They're quills. They're like hardened hair. And once they run back into you, they do actually leave the quills in you. If you were, a, like, a predator, like a lion, they would leave the quills in the face or in the front of the paws, and then the porcupine can run away and leave all the quills behind you. Oh, I see. And then, so what happens? They, they lose quite a few of their quills. Do they grow back? Yeah, the quills grow back. Like I so said, they're just like hair, so the new ones will be forming all the time and growing, and they're always shedding them. We're feeding them today. What are we going to feed them? Well, we have a mixed feed here. They're general sort of vegetables and fruit, and then we've got some extra nuts as well for them as well. So, what we're feeding them now, how does that... Is that similar to what they'd eat in the wild? Uh, no. <laughs> um, generally, we can't get the sort of things they'd necessarily eat in the wild. These are rodents. They would eat sort of um, all sorts of vegetables and, and um, wood, mainly in the wild. They'd be chewing on a lot of wood to keep their teeth down. They would come across nuts and berries and, and dropped fruit. Mm. They've been well known even to eat bones as well if they come across them in the wild. Really? Well, they're tucking into those nuts now, so they must have pretty strong teeth. They have incredibly strong teeth. They've been well known to even eat through concrete at some point. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So I take it that's why you've got all these wires around the enclosure. Are you worried about them escaping? We were slightly worried, but we've designed the cage in such a way that hopefully we've taken all the sort of things that we know they can do and made sure that they can't do it in here. Underneath all the wood chip, it's got um, wire mesh so they can't dig out. We've got electric wire around the side so they can't climb up or do anything. And um, all of the floors inside the shed are all tinned so they can't sort of, you know, chew anything of that either. Well, it sounds like you've got them really locked in. I hope so. There's four porcupines here. Is this a family? Yeah, we've got a mum and dad and two daughters. And have you got any plans for breeding programmes here? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two adults are of um, a breeding pair, so, I mean, we hope to get many more youngsters. I mean, we've built a big enough enclosure that we can house probably, you know, eight to ten porcupines, hopefully, in the future. Simon, they look fantastic, and they're certainly the coolest animals I've met in the park so far. We'll be keeping an eye on this family and we'll let you know as soon as there are any prickly new porcupines at the park. <laughs> what do you call a musical insect? A humbug. <laughs> Why can't you tell a cow a secret? Because it goes in one ear and out the other. <laughs> what do bees wear to the beach? Bee keenies. Thank you very much. Well, I've arrived in style at the De Brazza section with my chauffeur and primate keeper, Karen Price. It's time for one of their feeds. Karen, lead the way. So these are the De Brazzas. Yep, um, we're just feeding them their fruit this morning. Um, we have to split it up into bits so, so that Greedy Dad here doesn't take it all. Oh, I see. If we just hand it out, he'll just yep. swipe the lot, will he? Yeah. Uh, so if you take a bit of each. Yes. And who shall I feed? If you feed him, if you yep. go down a bit further and then... I can do the other two. OK, excellent. Yep. Here we go. Come on, then, Dad. So is this this is a family group, is it? Mum, yep. Dad and Baby? We've got Paddy the Dad. Here you go, got Paddy. Mum, here's Bertha and little Hathel. Ah. Little uh, Hathel's making squeaking noises at me. Yep. Does that, does that just mean give me some fruit? Yeah, she's <laughs> just excited. 
<laughs> they seem very, very keen. Oh, he's polishing that off. <laughs> Wonderfully dexterous fingers. And very, very distinctive markings. He's got this wonderful sort of red crest and uh, a long, long white beard. It's yeah. quite distinctive, isn't it? The beards, um, when they get angry, they open their mouths and show the teeth, and the yes. beard accentuates the look. Ah. When they get frightened, they would stay still, ah. just freeze on the spot, and they could like, stay ah. there for hours. Ah. I love the little croaky, croaky noises. Mm. They're so sweet, aren't they? And you've also given me these pellets. What's, what's in there? These are called primate pellets, and they're a complete diet that they get, full of vitamins and minerals and everything that they need. I'll give them some of those as well. Okay. So they're putting them straight in their mouths. They've got cheek pouches, and they'll eat it later. How much did they store in there? Do you think he polished off this whole lot? Yep. <laughs> Let's see if he'll take, the, uh, take every single one. I see, yeah, he just stops chewing and then stows it in a pouch, a bit like a hamster, I suppose. Yeah. And how old is the little baby? She's a year and three months. She's um, absolutely gorgeous, isn't she? Was she born here? Yep, this is the first Debraza baby we've had here with this pair. Quite small at the moment, but yeah. she's she's beginning to change into her adult colours at the moment. She should change about two years old. She actually hasn't got quite as vivid a. No, top. that that's just starting to come through. I should try that with my quiff. <laughs> 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 they polished that off very very quickly. Yeah, they, they were very hungry. Oh, it's lovely. You know, you know what? And whenever you need help feeding the Debraza monkeys, <laughs> I'm your man, and I think they're brilliant. <laughs> Today, animal manager and big boss Charlie is leaving his paperwork behind and seeing if he can cut it where it counts as a keeper with the big cat squad. They've devised a day of really tough tasks to keep him on his toes and he'll be right to feel nervous. Adrian's off today, yeah. so uh, yeah. if you come down to the vehicle we'll uh, go through your list of jobs. Yeah. Go easy on me, eh? I don't think so. No? Do you? Depends what you got for me. <laughs> Right, the first job we're going to do today yeah. is uh, the hunting dogs. Meet Kasala and Kanga, the leaders of this pack of 12 hunting dogs. These are Africa's most efficient and vicious killers. Like all dogs, Kanga's pack loves a bone, and their enclosure is littered with them. But it's essential that these old bones are cleared out. Now, imagine trying to take a bone off your average pooch. They tend to fight you for it. Then imagine you are taking bones from 12 dogs that are capable of killing you. Good luck, Charlie. There is just one thing we forgot to tell him. I regularly get bitten by dogs. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of mood are they in this morning? Uh, quite bad tempered this morning, by the looks of it. Are they? Yeah. They look like they're up for a fight. Charlie's nervously off to meet the 12 hungry killing machines. The new boy gives them a snack, which should keep the dogs distracted whilst he gets on with finding the bones. He can't keep the bones in the bucket, as the pack will definitely go for him then. So it's now vital he chucks them cleanly over the fence. Some of them just about finished their rabbits now, so... The sooner we can get done here, the better. I feel a lot better when we get out. He's sweating a lot as well. Looks quite nervous. Don't know why. Is that it, Pete? No, there's loads more to Loads yeah. more? Yeah. Look, you missed one by the fence, look. Well, you haven't done this very well, have you? Yeah, I can't do it all, Pete. Oh, look, loads. Hey. What have you been doing? Look, even the cows are coming to see you, Charlie. Suddenly, the dogs spot what Charlie's up to, and they're not happy about it. Oh, and off you go. Stand still, stand still, Charlie. These predators have a top speed of 35 miles per hour and will pursue their prey up to three miles before ruthlessly disemboweling it. 95% of their hunts end in a kill, so if they turn on Charlie, it'll be nasty. He's got to get out fast. Grrr, where's he gone? He faced the danger, but how well did he really do his task? No, he was rubbish, really. <laughs> yeah, can we improve then? Got a lot of improvement to make before the end of the day. 
I wouldn't input my input. Charlie's got lots more dangerous tasks to complete before the end of the day. Join us later to see how he gets on with over two metres of prime Indian tiger, which goes by the name of Harry. Come on, Charlie. Come on. My advice to you is work faster and harder. You're not doing very well at the moment. the lynx enclosure to ask keeper Alan Keeling all about these beautiful cats. What are the black tufts of hair for? The black tufts of hair. Um, they're actually there because they've got incredibly good hearing and um, the little tufts actually help them with that. It can also help with wind direction uh, so they can keep downwind when they're hunting. And I also noticed that their tails are actually quite short. Did you see that? Why have they got such short tails? Basically, they live in conifer forests and there's a lot of snow. It's a very barren landscape, so they don't really need to do a lot of climbing and things. Uh, and it's not exactly mountainous, really. So they don't really need their tails for balance or anything else like that. So basically, they're just involved with short ones. Did they ever try to chase birds like normal cats? Uh, yes, I mean, they'll chase pretty much anything that goes in there, including the keepers. Can they jump high? They can jump very high, yes. Uh, I mean, they have to. They're hunting birds, and they have to be able to jump up nice and high to catch them. Isabel. Do you have to trim their fur? Uh, do we have to trim their fur? Uh, no. Um, I mean, their hair will always keep growing. They molt out as well. So when it's winter, they get thicker fur, and then in the summer, they molt out, and they get their thinner coat as well. How do they stay clean? Do they give themselves a bath? Uh, no, they don't actually bath. They um, just groom themselves like your domestic cat. They lick their paws, they put it around their ears and things. Uh, and of course, they do groom each other as well. How many kittens would a mother give birth to? Uh, she would have four to five kittens. Um, and she'd find a nice little secretive place to have them. And uh, they'll be blind until they're about two weeks old. And then they'll probably come out and start moving around after the first month and a half or so. How can you tell if they're happy or angry? If they're angry, they'll arch their back, they'll turn sideways, their ears will go down, they make this blowing noise as well. Um, now, when they're happy, of course, they're just relaxed like they are with Chris at the moment. Um, their ears are forward, they're just sitting around quite happily. You know quite easily if they're not happy with you. Why did they have white tummies? Why did they have white tummies? Um, I don't know, really. Uh, that's an even, interesting I couldn't question. even answer that question. We got him. Alan doesn't know the answer. Well done, Naomi. We've checked in our books, and in case you were wondering, lynx have white tummies so that they don't overheat, because their white fur reflects light from the floor, whereas dark fur would absorb it. Will we be able to outwit the keepers again? Find out on the next Ask the Keeper. <laughs> No, you're right. This isn't Kent. This is Africa. You are looking at a very rare sight, as these shots show a wild black rhinoceros in the hills of southern Africa. Rhinos have been around for over 50 million years, but they are now highly endangered. In 1970, there were 65,000 black rhinos wandering the African plains. But barely 20 years later, 96% of them have been killed by poachers. They are hunted for their very valuable horns, which are still used today in traditional Chinese medicine and for ornamental dagger handles. Back in the cooler climate of the UK, the parks look after 20 black rhinos. This is actually the biggest collection outside of Africa. Over the years, they have successfully raised 26 youngsters. Recently, keeper Nick Turk had cause to celebrate. There was yet another birth up at the rhino house. And today, he's going to introduce us to baby black rhino number 27. We've got Rua and Mondula in here. Rua's the mum, um, and Mondula's a little boy, born about sort of eight weeks ago. Very healthy, very strong. About 40 pounds when they're born, and he's, he must be over 100 pounds now. He's about eight weeks old, suckling well. Going great guns in there, really. 
It's her first calf, so she's a little bit more protective and a little bit more wary of, of people and everything else around her, but otherwise she's, she's doing OK. Monduli is a particularly important rhino. His dad was born in the wild and not related to any of the park's other rhinos. This means that Monduli will be able to stay at the park and ultimately breed with other females. It will take a few years before Monduli is fully grown, but he is already starting to develop horns. In the wild, these are used for foraging for food and as a weapon if they are under threat. He's got two little um, lumps on his head which are, which are growing into horns like a mum, um, which are flat when they're born, and then as soon as they're born, they start growing. It's, it's basically made of keratin, which is um, the same material that your hair and, and fingernails are made of, and they just continually grow, and they wear them down over a period of time. Rhinos may look very aggressive, but they will only usually attack if they are threatened. Monduli may only look small, but the keepers still have to be careful around him. I guess he's relatively harmless at the moment, although incredibly strong. It would take more than one person to keep him down and hold him down. I mean, he, he could easily break your ribs if, if necessarily or do some damage with you if he hit you with his, with his head. Well, the next step for him will be um, hopefully putting him out in, in a paddock, a nice grass paddock for him to run around and, and um, get covered in mud, which is what they do naturally. They like to roll in mud. And, um, yeah, hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll do well when we get a nice bit of weather. We'll, we'll stick him out. So far, Munduli hasn't seen much of his new home, and his first steps outside promise to be his biggest challenge yet. Join us later when we will be there to see how he gets on. They can move their eyes in different directions, are masters of disguise, and eat like nothing else. This is the Veiled Chameleon. These veiled chameleons are new to the park, and Keeper Rich Barnes thinks they're pretty cool. Because of, you know, the things that they've got and things that they do, um, yeah, they're just really, really awesome. Veiled chameleons are found in Yemen and southern Saudi Arabia, which are incredibly hot countries. Veiled chameleons are one of the most common chameleons and are incredibly resilient. However, they are often needlessly killed and made into souvenirs for tourists. Rich has a couple of females and a male chameleon that he looks after. But being the same colour as these leaves, they can be rather hard to find. Just there. You see that one there? Well, they've got very, very sharp claws. You can see the claws are quite, quite sharp. Um, and the way in which they grasp as well, they've got these funny little hands which just grip onto stuff. Ideal for gripping onto your fingers. Um, but they dig those nails right in. And they've also got, as you can see, a prehensile tail. This acts as another limb just to kind of let them hang around and be a bit more secure. <laughs> You may be fooled into thinking chameleons look a lot like dragons. Well, they're not, but they do have some pretty magical powers. The eyes of the chameleon are sort of independent of one another. Um, it's useful for them uh, as they, obviously, they're, they're stalkers, they stalk their prey, so they have to creep down a branch. And what they tend to do is keep an eye out on the prey with one eye, whilst the other one's kind of just watching to see um, any aggressors coming towards it or anything that's going on around it. So that is how they find their prey, but what do they eat? We, we try to vary it as much as possible. I mean, he's rather partial to the old locust. Um, the bigger, the better, really. OK, so grubs up, but how is he going to eat it? Wow, we've got to see that again. The tongue's got a slightly larger end, which is kind of sticky, and that kind of sticks onto the, the locust, the cricket, whatever, and then pulls it straight back, almost like a spring-loaded kind of action back to the, the mouth. And then 
obviously because their mouth's open anyway, go straight in. Um, unfortunately, sometimes if the food's too big, it does kind of just smack them in the face. Rich's chameleons love humid environments, so he wets down their enclosure twice a day. They don't enjoy this very much, so they do one of their best-known tricks, changing colour. Check out how this female changes from this to this. The, one of the females there at the back, she's, she's basically got herself up out of the way of, uh, of the shower. and. Um, whether she's conscious that she's starting to get a little bit stressed because of it or she's not, um, she's actually changed colour. Um, it would seem that it's not really um, a conscious thing, something that they're doing. It's just something that happens when they get into a certain type of mood or whatever. And it's just like that. There is definitely nothing else quite like the chameleon at the park, and Rich loves caring for them. Well, they've just got, you know, they've got everything they've got. Tongue comes out, uh, the eyes, they move independently, the, the fact that they change colour, um, it's pretty much everything, really. Yeah, they're funky little things, yeah. There are 22 species of primates at the parks, but they are not all monkeys. This is a Moloch gibbon. <laughs> Gibbons are actually a type of ape, and this Moloch gibbon is currently critically endangered, with less than 2,000 left in the wild. This one is called Marlena, and I've come to find out why keeper Lucy Burkett thinks she's such a star. Lucy, why is Marlena so special? Um, she's very special because she's had quite a few babies, and um, breeding gibbons in captivity is not very easy, so the fact that she's had so many and even has grandchildren here is very Does special. Does she really? Yeah. Uh, and is she likely to have any more? We're hoping she's going to have some more. Yeah, yeah, she's about 22. Ooh, she's keen to get her so. hands on those grapes. <laughs> and why is it so important that um, there is a successful breeding programme here at Howlett's? Uh, well, Moloch gibbons are one of the most endangered species of gibbon. Um, so, um, potentially, the more we can breed, the better. And keep this programme going is very important for um, knowledge on gibbons, you know, people can study them and learn about them and see them. And why are Moloch gibbons so endangered, Lucy? Um, largely it's habitat destruction and the pet trade. Um, Java is a very populated island and they're only found in Java and it's not a very big island. Um, and then um, people like to have them as pets and the, pe the pet trade is very destructive to the family groups. So for every one infant that you find in captivity, there have probably been about four or five others killed in that process. Oh, wow. Well, Lucy, it's fantastic to meet her. She is certainly very special. Don't go away because we've got loads of fantastic animals for you to meet on the rest of the programme. Is Monduli brave enough to go into the great outdoors? We're about to find out. We see how Charlie gets on when he comes face to face with lions and tigers. And Alex and I get grilled on the gorillas. Remember this eight-week-old rhino? Well, this is Monduli, and he was the 27th black rhino to be born at the park. And today is a very exciting day. He is about to go into the grass paddock for the very first time. This will be a very big adventure for him, and Keeper Nick can't wait to see how he reacts. It'll be great to see him out there. They've been in this yard for the last sort of eight weeks or so, so it'll be nice to get her out. You know, we've had it's a fairly dry day today, and. You know, a bit cold but dry, which is which is okay. The calf will be running around like a mad thing, and um, yeah, it's quite exciting, really. Good girl. All right. Good girl. All right. Monduli's been out in the yard before, but the grassy paddock will be a new experience, particularly for his nose. They do have a good sense of smell, good hearing, and poor eyesight, so they kind of rely on the, the smell and the uh, hearing, and, and he'll just play around, he'll buck around, he'll, he'll, he'll find something different to smell, he'll, he'll, he'll smell that, and it's all just unusual for him at the moment. He's doing well out there, 
But like any youngster in a new place, Monduli wants to keep close to his mum. Yeah, he'll, he'll just investigate the area around her for a while, and then as he gets more confident, he'll then um, sort of go off on his own a little bit more. Later on, he'll just run away and just come back, and he might he might lose her for a bit, and there then he'll do a little squeak, and then where you know where are you sort of thing, and my mum will hear that and um, come and find him and, and wonder what's going on. While mum gets stuck into her lunch, Monduli watches closely and tries to copy her. At the moment, he is still suckling milk from her, but soon he will start trying fruit and branches. Although Monduli will learn how to be a rhino from watching mum. Like any youngster, some things are just instinctive. Like getting messy. Rhinos love to cover themselves in mud. It helps to keep them cool and is great for their skin. It's a great sign that Monduli has gone straight into the muck, and Nick is delighted with his progress. It's very exciting to see. Obviously, it's um, Mum's first calf. We've, we've got another calf, Damara, who's a couple of weeks older than um, Monduli. These two have been the only calves we've had for the last sort of couple of years, and um, it'll be good if um, in the future we have a few more. I could be a keeper for the day. I was really excited. I was jumping around the whole house. Today, Marcus will be looking after the largest cat in the world. And to do that, he's going to have to get up really close. The tiger's probably going to be bigger than me, and it's, it's a bit nerve-wracking. Tigers have an understandably fearsome reputation, and as a tiger keeper, Marcus is going to have to be very careful. But he won't be in any danger, because today he's doing the rounds with Howlett's keeper, Jim Vassie. Hi, you must be Marcus. Yeah, I'm Marcus. Hi, I'm Jim, Hi. head of cats here at Howlitz. I see you've been looking at the hunting dogs, but you're not here to see them. You're here to give me a hand with my tiger, so shall we make a move? Okay. Got some work to do. All right. They have seven tigers at Howlitz at the moment, but before Marcus gets to meet one in person, he's going to have to get his hands dirty and clean one of their enclosures. This is my Land Rover where I keep all the stuff up that we're going to be using to clean the tigers with. Oh, the meat stinks. <laughs> this is uh, the Indian male's chotes our 18-year-old uh, Indian tiger. It's a huge moment for Marcus. Entering a tiger's cage is a once-in-a-lifetime experience, even if the tiger is locked away. Sure he's not hiding? I hope, I hope not. Now you're inside a tiger cage. Right, first thing we need to do is take a walk around the perimeter of the cage and look for any poo. Yeah? Poo? Yep. Yeah. OK. Does it sink? Um, not really. Poo collecting isn't the nicest job in the world, but it's important for keeping the enclosure looking and smelling as good as it can. Find some more poo here, so we'll get that picked up. And... Uh. That goes in there. Well, I think that's all the poo. It's time for the fun bit, feeding time, and that's a 15 kilo slab of meat. That's the, that's the new bit for him, so if you like to drag that off the back. That's it. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> well done. How often do they get fed? Well, they get fed every three days, yeah? Yeah. So this is going to last him now until next week. With the grim jobs done, Marcus now has to make sure the tiger is comfortable. Betty's never plumped up a tiger's bed or cleaned out one's pool before. It stinks. <laughs> well, according to you, everything stinks. Put your back into it. You're not supposed to be having a shower. Sorry. Can I throw your boots up? No, you don't. <laughs> Enclosure finished. Marcus just needs to secure the gates and then he can meet the tiger for the first time. Yeah? Okay. Right. Here's the big fan, big man himself. Look. Hello, Jones. Hello. He's a good boy. Okay, so if you grab that and pull towards you, that's it. Right, that's enough. And as soon as he's through, push back. Massive. Yeah. Right, if we go around the front, we'll see what he does first. See that, see that when he picked up and shaked it, yeah? yeah? Shook it. That's because he just killed it. That's, that's what he would do. He's going to take it in his shed now, look, and hide it. We've done that, so shall we go and see about feeding one of the other tigers? Okay. Yeah? Okay. 
Having done such a great job cleaning out Choate's the Indian Tiger's enclosure, Jim has a treat in store for Marcus. Good boy. He's going to introduce him to Malchek, the Siberian Tiger. Now, Siberian Tigers are the largest cats to walk the planet, and Malchek weighs more than six Marcuses and is as long as two Jims. It's not his feed day today, but he won't say no to a few tidbits. Right, you know, just poke it through. That's it. Poke it through. Wow. Oh, hang on. Whoa, whoa. He's getting the stick, but not the bit of meat. That's it. He's amazing. <laughs> when the tiger jumped up, it was really exciting. It was bigger than most things I've seen. <laughs> bigger than a grizzly bear. Uh-huh. Yeah? It's been a really good experience because I've learned more about big cats that I haven't known before. Let's go get some work out of you, boy, hey? That's all right. It's all right. It's all right. We're always asking the keepers questions about the animals, but today it's time to get their own back. We're down at the gorilla house with keepers Laura and Matt, and today they have set us rather a tricky challenge. Yep, we've got to learn the names of the gorillas and how each one relates to the rest of the group. Now, it may sound easy to you, but to me they all look exactly the same. I think it's going to be impossible. No cheating. <laughs> OK. Right, Matt, lesson starts here. OK, I'm ready. I've got my, I've got my clipboard, I've got my pencil. Okie dokie. I've got a nice, easy one for you. OK. We've got Kifu over there. Which one's Kifu? Really obvious one, big male silverback. Ah, oh, I can get that, I can get that. Kifu. Boss of the group. OK, is he the only one with a silver back? Yeah. OK. Yeah, he's and... the most dominant in the group. Will he only develop that silver back if he's... Becomes dominant, or will all males? Develop? All males will develop a silver back, but okay. not necessarily the uh, leader of the group. Oh. Okay, gotcha. All right, I've got all okay. that. And he's 19 years old. 19. Okay. Okay. Who are these two gorillas here? Okay, the largest gorilla there, that's Tebby, and um, she's one of the adult females. And the little male there, that's um, Ibiki, that's her son. Tebby's quite a uh, large gorilla. So is she the biggest female? Um, she's one of the biggest females. Yeah. And like I say, she's a very intelligent animal. She's probably one of the most intelligent um, gorillas that we have here. Right up in the space frame there. Up there? Yep. Yeah. This is Miranda. She's free in a bit. Yeah. A good way of spotting, as we call her, little Mo, yeah. is she's got rather a big nose for her face. <laughs> here. OK, we've got Sunder. Um, just at the back there. Ah, oh, yes, and there's a little baby with Sunder. Yeah, that's little um, Undi. She's um, about four months old now. Undi looks really tiny. Isn't yeah. she lovely? It's quite a good way to recognise Sunder is that Undi would normally be quite close to her. So how long will a baby gorilla stay with its mum for, then? Um, well, Undi will stay in quite close contact with Sunder for the first maybe... 10 months, something like that, and then after that they progressively get more independent, but they'll be suckling from Sunder for maybe up to something like three years, it just depends as long on... As that. Yeah, different females, yeah. you know, it just depends. Different mm. individuals, they're all different, so... When they, were, when they were playing around just now, was that just playing or were they fighting? No, no, that's playing. Yeah, okay. uh, the youngsters, we've got eight youngsters in this group. Um, so the youngsters are, are always playing, always tumbling around in the straw, going through the space frame, the, swinging on the ropes. These having a little cuddle now. Yeah. Very cute. Are they, are they related to all those two? They're half brothers. Oh, they shared, uh, share the same father, but different mums. Who's that? Um, that's Tan Barbie there. Tan Barbie, she likes her food, so she's a little bit larger than some of the others. I can and just see... Oh, yes, she's just turning now, and you can see she's got quite a big tummy. <laughs> oh, she's disappeared behind the, that big tyre there. And sometimes when she sits down, her bottom lip comes out, and you can see the inside of her lip, which is pink. That's oh, quite a good way of That's a good way of remembering. She has got a big tummy, hasn't she? Look at that. <laughs> hey, you guys, how are you getting on? Well, all right, it's been fantastic to spend some time with gorillas, but I don't know, there's a lot of names to remember. <laughs> I know. My brain's in meltdown already. I don't know how you keepers do it. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Mm. 
but uh, we've got a test, apparently. Yep, yeah, so you two better go and get some revision done, and I'll see you back here in an hour. Oh, let's yeah. go, then, I'm going to win this one. <laughs> no, looking at That's my what notes. You think. <laughs> Meet Harry. Harry is a massive Indian tiger, and when he wants to be, a savage killing machine. He's going to play a major part in the next challenge for Big Boss Charlie's Day, working with the keepers from the Big Cat section. Charlie just about survived his meeting with the hunting dogs, but how will he cut it here? Over to Pete for the introductions. This is Harry. He's 18 years old. He's um, one of our ham rear tigers. Nice little chap on you. And uh, you're <laughs> going to clean him out. Am I? Yes. Seems to have a very nice temperament, Pete. He is. Or is he's it around you? Um, he's very selective. He does. Is he? If he doesn't like you, he'll let no, them have Harry. you. Okay. We're going to practice some tiger calls. Yeah, I'll, I'll right. follow you. Fuffing. <laughs> That's a tiger with a lisp. <laughs> is it? Try, try not to spit so much. I'm getting wet here. Harry. Harry. <laughs> he's not that interested in me. I think right? he thinks you're a foreign tiger, if anything. Harry. Come and listen to Charlie's tiger. Here we go. Tiger call. Mm. Nothing's working, Pete. <laughs> it's just been discovered that some tiger calls have such high frequencies that, like bats, tigers are making noises that we can't hear with our ears. Oh. 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 Therefore, Harry is the only one in the park who can get away with saying absolutely anything to boss man Charlie. Boy. And now for the task. Harry's shed needs a clean. Pete's pretty keen that I uh, change the, the whole bed and uh, we, we give him a new bed for tonight. Maybe he's gone easy on me first up. I don't know. We'll see when we get in there, I guess. What Charlie doesn't know is that the keepers have selected Harry's shed for a reason. At the grand old age of 18, Harry's now incontinent, which means he wheezes a lot and his shed is the stinkiest on the park. Right, before we go in, Charlie, what we're going to do is um, there's a couple of bones in there, need chucking out first, yeah. then all the wet straw. You have to go through it with your hands. Oh, lovely. But because you've not done this, lovely. Um, part of our health and safety things, you need to have um, gloves on. So uh, we've got you some gloves. <laughs> Mindful of Charlie's delicate office hands, Pete has thoughtfully brought him along some safety equipment. No, they're, they're brand new, Charlie. They were, um, <laughs> especially for you. <laughs> It's now time for Charlie to get elbow deep in tiger pee. Imagine if your cat pees on the carpet, it stinks. Harry is 20 times larger than your moggy and produces that much more pee a day. Come on, Charlie. Come on. My advice to you is work faster and harder. You're not doing very well at the moment. Charlie's putting on a brave face, but he can hardly breathe. Very strong um, urine type smell. This shed hasn't been cleared out for a full three days. If this was smell vision you'd be out the room. Come on, Charlie. I think he's a bit worried about getting the marigolds wet, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely your colour, aren't they? Well, we're going to take this out yeah. and um, then we'll go and get Harry's medication and um, we give him his uh, medication by hand. Right, this is uh, Harry's medication for all these um, ageing ailment problems. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you can't just chuck a pill into a tiger's mouth. They mm -hmm. don't take it like that, so we disguise it by hiding it in meat. Yep. But just make sure your fingers are clear of his mouth. But hold on to the meat till he's actually got it right in and start to swallow it, otherwise he'll just spit it out. OK, yeah, you ready? Yeah, yeah. Harry! With teeth up to seven centimetres long, tigers have the longest canine teeth of all the big cats. So if Charlie gets this wrong, he could lose a finger. Grab it properly. Yeah, hold on to it. Hang on. No. So keep hold of it. Keep hold of it. Don't let it go. There you go. It's all right. There you go. Charlie kept his nerve and pulled it off. All right. It's all right. Okay, mate. Okay. Yeah, it felt good. It's nice. He enjoyed his meat as well. It was a nice bit of meat he had, so I think he was more interested in the meat than my hand. Harry let Charlie off easy, but coming up later, he has to enter this lion's den. 
Find out how our former bird keeper and current pen pusher fares when he meets Africa's most famous carnivores. Earlier on, Matt and I had to learn everything there was to know about this group of gorillas. You may be thinking that they're all black and hairy, but you would be wrong. Every one of them is an individual, and the keepers can tell the difference between them, just like you can with your friends. But have we learnt enough about the gorillas to be able to hold our heads up high in the park? It's time to find out. OK, I hope you guys have been doing your revision. I've tried to keep them as easy as possible, so clipboards, please. Oh, I don't no know. No cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got a clue. There's so many names. It's and really the hard. first question is for Matt. Yes, I'm ready. Matt, what is the name of the silverback? Kifu. That's such an easy question, Laura. AKA a Mr. K. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alex, a really nice easy one. Great, I need one. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the youngest gorilla in the group? I know this, I know this. It's Undi. Undi is the little baby born in February. Check me out, I know that. Yeah. She's very cute. <laughs> okay, Matt. Yes. How can we recognise Miranda? Um, Miranda has. Um, Another easy one for you, Alex. What is Undi's mum called? Ah, oh, I know this, I know this. Uh, it's, it's Sunda. Sunda, I'm sure about that. Matt, how old is Miranda? Miranda is three. Seems quite confident about this. I'm a bit suspicious. OK, Alex, how would you recognise Tambarvi? Ooh, these questions are hard. Tam Barbie, is she uh, the one with the kind of brown on her coat? What do you mean? Do you know? She's do you know? Her bottom lipstick's out. And she also uh, has a big nose. This is crazy. Well, I've just been revising <laughs> as you were supposed to be. <laughs> the test is over. OK, guys, we have a winner. But who will it be? Who gets to be King Kong? And who got them all wrong? And the winner was Matt. Oh, I sort of knew it. I knew it was coming. Are you sure you didn't look at the question? No, I promise you I didn't. <laughs> I just had a good teacher. Laura, thank you very oh, much for introducing Laura. us to the gorillas. Brilliant. That's okay. <laughs> what do you get if you cross a plane with a gorilla? King Kong <laughs> What do you call a cow that eats grass? A lawnmower. <laughs> What's an owl's favourite subject? Algebra. <laughs> Today, head of animals and one of the park's biggest bosses, Charlie, is finding out if he can hack it as a keeper. He has faced savage dogs, been knee-deep in tiger pee, and then hand-fed them medicine. But now Pete's handing him over to Chris, who's literally taking him into the lion's den. Basically, Charlie, right, first off, I want you to uh, give this water bowl clean out here. Yep. Uh, just to warn you, though, obviously, you're going to be pretty close to the uh, to the enclosure there, so, uh, so they might come and give you, uh, mm, yeah, you know, a little check-out and everything. <laughs> Meet the Pride, Jade, Juma, Aisha and Layla. They are Barbary lions, which are the really famous ones you'll recognise from the movies. Due to hunting, however, these lions no longer exist in the wild. It's only females in this enclosure, and they don't like new faces in their den. OK, all I want you to do, Charlie, is give this, uh, give this one a little bit of a out. All right. There I go. Um, there's a bung over at the end there, so what we've got to do is uh, just pull that out. It doesn't need to twist or anything. Cool. That's it. Just give it a good scrub. For Charlie, once a bird keeper, cleaning their bowl brings him uncomfortably close. As you can imagine, they're very unpredictable. You've heard them growling and carrying on. Um, I think he told me they were on a starf day today, so... <laughs> I don't want to be dinner. He's actually doing a good job. <laughs> Why do you sound surprised? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen you put so much effort into anything. <laughs> right, Charlie, got your... Uh... Next up, it's the Big Cat Squad's worst task of the day. These lionesses eat a massive 25 kilos of meat each week. 
in burger terms, that's 220 quarter pounders per week and 11,500 per year. Which means when it comes to cleaning out their den, there's a lot of poo to be picked up. It's your weapon of choice. OK. Scrape up the poo like that and chuck it in, OK? All right. Pretty pongy. It certainly is, isn't it? Not what that carnival poo smells like. <laughs> this is a nice one here for you. Lovely. All right, it's got the action already. I think you're more complimentary than Pete was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. There you go, Smory. Have you cleared this this week or what? Hey? Oh, I've been off for a hey. couple of days. <laughs> I think you've left it for me, haven't you? Oh, well, you know, we don't want to make it too easy for you. Charlie's finally found his calling. He's becoming the perfect poo collector and he's even starting to enjoy this smelly task. Lovely being out in the sun. Um, I guess not so nice in the winter. I tell the truth, it's not really that bad. You get used to it, don't you? So here we go. Cool, what's that, Chris? There we go. Just <laughs> bits of skin and a couple of bones. There you go, that's nice. Lovely. I'm starting to like this, Chris. Ah, it's nice to hear. There you go, so we've got just a. Charlie, what was that? Did you just flick some poo under a leaf? Look at that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is cheating, Chris. You wouldn't see a proper yeah. keeper doing that. <laughs> Charlie's final job of the day is to let the lions back into their pristine den. He survived his day with a big cat squad, but the question remains, did he really cut it as a keeper? Pete and Chris have joined forces to mark just how well they thought Charlie did. He will get graded A to D, and anything below a C is a fail. I told you these keepers were tough. Collecting the wild dog bones out on the, out on the African experience, how did he do with that? Well, he was flapping a lot, so I mean, we give him a C for that, and I mean, that's being generous. Give him a C, OK. Next one he did was cleaning Harry's shed. Mm, again, I think to see he did okay, but um, I mean, he, was, he was more worried about getting his hands dirty. To be honest, maybe then he should have a D because if he was worried about getting his hands dirty, but he didn't want to wear the gloves, he's uh, not taking orders, is he? No. As you're in charge of him. Yeah. There you go. Right. Sorry, Charlie. D. You've got a D there. Blimey! I'm glad these guys weren't teachers at my school. So uh, feeding Harry's medication. Um, he did that adequately, we'll say. No, okay. we'll, we'll give him a B for that. Give him a B? Yeah. That's very kind of you. The, uh, the final one, collecting the, uh, the lion poo in the, uh, the enclosure here. Yeah. Um, he actually, he did OK with this, but we did actually catch him flicking it uh, underneath the bush there. So it's a D for Charlie. He's failed and got a lot to learn. Overall, what do you think? He wasn't totally useless. Not far off it, but... <laughs> oh, that was pretty harsh. But Charlie doesn't seem to mind. I think it got on all right. I think um, going back doing a bit of keeping for the day was, was quite a bit of fun. I knew the guys would have a bit of a go. I mean, it's always good to have a go at your boss. It was a nice change to get out of the office. Quite enjoyed it. But it looks like Charlie will be staying behind his desk. Well, at least it's a lot safer. Well, it's almost the end of the show, but before we go, we've just popped over to see some of our favourite animals here at the park, the spectacular giraffe. This is their keeper, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hello. And normally they're out and about in the 150-acre safari area, aren't they? Why are they in here today? They are. I'll seize the opportunity of, sort of bringing them in just so the vet can give her a once-over when he pops in later, okay. make sure everything's OK. Well, it's lovely for us because uh, we get close up. She's got such a long tongue. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> How do they use that? Because they feed up in the trees, don't they? Yeah, it's almost prehensile. They wrap the tongue around branches and pull the leaves down and strip bark, bark and uh, bits off. You know. It's quite a useful thing to yeah. have. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we're very nearly out of time. Thanks very much, Paul. I've got one more question for Alex. Alex, do you know what they call a group of giraffes? Yes, is it herd? 
No, it's not a herd. It's something oh. to do with their height. It's, in fact, a tower of giraffes. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> well, make sure that you're watching out for the next Roar, where we'll be meeting lots more exciting animals, including... We try and get the perfect imprint of a lion's paw. Help! I have my hands full feeding this snow leopard. And one of the park's rarest monkeys gets a terrible bite wound on his hand. 